Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 71, Science Faction Lutetium. Oh, I thought it said lutetium, and I was like, oh, but it, it could be lutetium. I like the irony of me trying to keep <laughs> science knowledge prevalent and then not even looking up how to s- pronounce <laughs> the basic elements that I'm doing this on. I yes. like lutetium more. Yeah, well, the way you said it sounded more like a, like a Filipino word, like a Tagalog word. As we, go, as we go into lutetium, we are boldly exiting the Lanthide series and venturing into the transitional metals. In honor of Bruce Jenner? Yeah. Or? <laughs> no more lasers? Oh. <laughs> as such, it has some non-laser and x-ray related uses. It can be used for detectors in PET, positron emission tomography scans. It's also in LED bulbs, which are pretty cool. And most interesting, lutetium-176, which is relatively abundant, about 2.5%, has a half-life of 38 billion years. Holy crap. So we use it to date meteorites. That's do you have to ask their cool. father, or does <laughs> like what's, what's the courtship for a meteorite? Caveat: We have not actually lab tested that half life. <laughs> 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 Haven't gotten all the way to the thirty eight billion. Results in progress. <laughs> I am your host, archaeologist and comedian Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my biomedical research scientist Jackie. Jackie, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I've just had a birthday. Woo woo! And um, in this year of my life, and in this time, I've really done some soul searching and I wanted to shed all of the stuff I don't need and just live a really full life and get rid of Damien mm-hmm. and so I'm just looking towards the next year as you know Damien free and loving it oh she is one year older but looks five and sitting next to her is our comedian Mr. Damien Mercado Damien how you doing tonight I'm a little uncertain right now because either she was saying she was going to quit or that I'm about to be fired from the podcast I don't we'll know. There's no see. other ways to reduce we'll our contact. See. I don't want to ruin it. All right. We are broadcasting here from the Madhouse Comedy Club along the beautiful skyline of downtown San Diego. You guys, if you haven't checked it out already, go check out our website, thesciencefaction.com. Even if you've already listened to this and you're not that interested in podcasts, we're kind of turning it into a science news aggregation site, the science version of Huffington Post, so to speak. So go ahead and uh, check in there periodically throughout the week and see interesting science news. Perhaps you should give them the website, not just you're talking about it. I, I, as did, I, did, as I mentioned before, faction. I'll mention once again to people who don't pay attention to the show. <laughs> it's thesciencefaction.com. That's At, two E's. No, just one. <laughs> no. one God, this is the worst. Okay, we are going on to science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, in Science Articles this week, very, very interesting stuff, guys. Bacteria on your shoes or your cell phone may be the next fingerprinting in criminal cases. Cool. So some interesting research coming out. There's already existing studies that have shown that individuals have a unique microbiome, so matching particular types and quantities of certain bacteria can indicate the person that's using an item. So every one of us has our own set of bacteria, and you know, types, mm-hmm. percentages, subspecies, everything that's unique to us, and it's a fingerprint. If I found something that was a remnant of Jackie's microbiome, you know, if I found something that didn't have her own DNA but was, but, let's say, a, I'm sorry, a cheek swab. The toilet was not working. Yes. I don't, I don't know. My remnant... I tried. Let's say I took a cheap swab from, from Jackie, or if I didn't have like a Q-tip, I just took a swab off some black dude's dick anywhere around her. Same thing as a cheap swab from Jackie. <laughs> Only I, or, if they're over 6'3". This is 60% semen on this. I don't... <laughs> Even if I don't have her DNA, even if I didn't get any DNA on there. You got his though, didn't you? If I, got, if I got the bacteria that she has in there, I can tell it's her based on her unique microbiome. And that's kind of like a little fingerprint that you leave behind. Each of us is our own Gaia. That's... <laughs> So further research might be able to link the particular microbiome that you leave on specific items to an individual. So you talk on a cell phone and the particular bacteria that you breathe out onto that cell phone, which we've studied, might be able to link you to that later on. So even if it's not your cell phone, we might be able to tell if somebody spoke on that cell phone or utilized it. How useful is that? Presumably lots of people would have spoken on a cell phone. Is right, but if you phone? Phone? Just to isolate one person, say so at some point they talked on this phone? If you find a burner phone and you, you think it belongs to this criminal and he's thrown it out and there are no fingerprints on it, if you can look at the microbiome on there and link it to him, then you can prove that he's the one that's using it. 
Yeah. Larger question, who actually uses the phone function on their phone anymore? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I haven't put my mouth up to the phone. and Well, there was that picture. <laughs> there was Black Dick App. <laughs> a Black Dick App was an app that, you know what, I think you get it. But I'm just seeing the same, the same setbacks that there would be for DNA or fingerprints, which is if you're not in the database. Yeah, you'd have to be in the database, be the database, obviously, but it's still, it's still an ability to link. So there were two studies. One looked at somebody's cell phones. And they basically looked at phones and found each one had its own unique microbiome that was like a fingerprint. Hopefully, you know, we can link that to people later on and be able to tell where those things came from. That would be very useful. But the other one, which was more interesting, studied the shoes of 89 people randomly selected at three separate scientific conferences within the United States. They found that the bacteria on the soles of their shoes could be categorized by the location they were in. So if you went to the lab, you could tell this was from the conference in Colorado, this Mm -hmm. was from the conference in the East Coast, based on the bacteria that's on the soles of their shoes. Furthermore, you could also tell the individual you had a unique biological footprint based on the bacteria inside the shoe, which Mm, is unique to their feet. If you found Cinderella's matching slipper, so to speak, you could match it to the person and tell, in a broad sense, where they had been. How long am I going to carry that dirt from Colorado on the bottom of my shoe? It's a lot longer than you think. What really? if it was raining? <laughs> then that'd be mud, and that would definitely stay. You need to buy new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could see this in like a criminal application. You know, They find somebody murdered in the woods. His best friend says, I've never been in that, those woods before. I have no right, idea what yeah. you're talking about. If you can trace him to that specific area... Obviously, this is going to take kind of a mapping procedure where you go around and figure out where bacteria comes from. And it's a big, large thing. But But they have that for soil and stuff now. That wouldn't be – I mean – And insects. They do this a lot for insects. I saw a case where they found certain insects in the radiator of a person's rental car. And they're like, we knew you were in the southwest when you said you weren't. And that's where somebody was killed. You know, you can do that. Robert Durst. (laughs) Going down, bitch. <laughs> oh, they had bodies and that guy didn't go down. I don't think some bugs in the radiator are no, taking his rich No, this is going to be the one. <laughs> <laughs> this is a small study and it's fairly imprecise, but to me it seems like a harbinger of things to come. There's already been a swing in forensics and physical anthropology research away from studying entomology determinations of death, which is bug-based. So before, yeah. one of the best ways to tell how long ago somebody died, if they're in the woods, is to look at the types of bugs and the, the stages of larva that they're in to know how long ago the body died. Now we're starting to look at bacteria, which are much more precise because Mm -hmm. they change quicker and they multiply quicker and all that means you take out a lot of the margin for error. So we're starting to look at that and swing towards these bacterial determinations for how long a body's been gone. So bacteria may become a very big part of forensic science in the near future, especially in identifying people or figuring out how long they've been dead. Do only the hipster forensic scientists still use etymology? Yeah, it's so out, it's back in. (laughs) I think studying the microbiome of individuals, of things they've come in contact with, and people they're close to may prove to be the next forensic leap. It's kind of going to be like DNA was 25 years ago, and that a famous black football player will kill somebody, be convicted by their microbiome, but it won't be public knowledge enough for the jury to to accept it, so he'll get off anyway. (laughs) And there'll still be a Kardashian involved. (laughs) Ah! (laughs) Sight unseen, which show would you rather watch? Forensic Leap or Quantum Leap? I feel like Forensic Leap would get pretty dark. So yeah, that. I'd go with that. It's like like an episode of seven every time. Yeah. Oh, awesome. A couple questions for my panelists. Question number one. This is very interesting research, but crime, as we all know, is an arms race. What countermeasures will clever criminals adopt to ensure bacteria doesn't land them in a different kind of cell? More arms. Wait, did you get my joke? Bacteria cell. (laughs) Yes. I've just been waiting to say more arms since you said it was an arms race. (laughs) You get gloves that are essentially like hollowed out other people's hands. I mean, I... Oh, sort of like the suit the guy makes in Signs of the Lambs of other skin? And then you get a second head surgically attached, Uh you know, like a a two-headed creature that does all the talking on burner phones for you. Okay. But then a different head would still have the same gut microbiome. I mean, like, what, are they taking toilet paper swabs? Like, what are, what are they? <laughs> well, that's that's, what, that's sometimes, what, yes. That's what comes up your esophagus and into your mouth. Hmm. All right, we're going to need to, we're going to have to go you, cow with this. I need two separate stomachs, <laughs> two separate esophaguses. You, you heard the scientist, Damien. Your theory of sewing somebody's head onto your neck is silly and laughable. Preposterous. How dare you? Jackie, what about you? Uh, now, I'm assuming you don't mean the cell, the movie, yeah, which they we don't talk want, about exactly. a lot he here. Doesn't want, he doesn't want to get locked in a movie with Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> you mean like a jail cell. That's right. What a future criminal is going to do to keep that bacteria from catching them? Because now people wear gloves to keep off fingerprints, yeah, right? Or they walk around that 
hand sanitizer constantly. They spray, they spray their blood with bleach, a la Boondock Saints, to keep the I DNA from being figured out. They're gonna get in those, you know, those um, super tight latex bodysuits that's used in like S and M and stuff. Okay. I think that's going to be the new black face mask. It'll just be a full body suit. Okay. The only like a thing, barrier. Yeah, like a barrier. And then maybe they'll dip themselves in Lysol right before they go out. Yeah, too. yeah. Not only will this help us fight crime, but it's also going to help us fight the crime of bad manners. Like, we're going to be able to tell who washes their hands regularly after using the bathroom and who doesn't. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. true. We should start doing that more. Just the, the swab. It's kind of like the old, if you pee in the pool, it'll turn blue myth. They yeah. should have some guy yeah. who's designated in the party with a chemical on his hands. And if you have fecal matter, his hands turn blue. <laughs> oh, <but laughs> gross. Yeah, but don't, wouldn't both guys' hands turn blue? You know, actually, we have that. We use that in no, the it's only it would only be the dude who's got the chemical on his hands. When he touches somebody else's hands, his hands would turn. Blue. I could bring you that chemical tomorrow. You have fecal blue chemical? Yes. Bring it tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to use this a bunch. Damn it, I need to go buy soap tonight. <laughs> Damien's going to look like a fucking smurf. <laughs> He's going to rub it all over his face. Somehow his hair is clean. I don't know why. <laughs> you should see the way my glass table looks. <laughs> On to question number two. This is just one more example of how getting away with crimes is so much harder nowadays. 50 years ago, you could kill a guy and then just move to another town far enough away that you'd be fine. Even if they got your fingerprints on a murder weapon, once you were out of that legal jurisdiction, no other law enforcement agency had access to those fingerprints. There was no DNA evidence, no microbiomes, no surveillance camera, no camera phones, no internet, no universal communication of local law enforcement, and no one had helicopters. So even if you got caught doing something, you had a 50-50 chance of getting away if you had a V8 and a full tank of gas. Even Cosby had to adapt and give up most of his heavy raping in the late 70s. <laughs> if you were around in the 40s and forced into a life of crime, how would you exploit the system and live that life of crime without getting caught? Leave the gun in a black part of town every time. <laughs> <laughs> that would really work in the 40s. Like yeah, you, There would be no, no question. questions asked. No questions. And there's also a part of this you're leaving out, too. You know, like, do you think cops of today being just ex high school football players and do you think that's just a recent thing no it's always like you know, i think <laughs> yeah, way totally. back before it was always the tough guy the guy who could handle a criminal it never yeah. was the best guy at solving things yeah. problems yeah there's, there's a lot less sleuths going out there really looking for you i feel like i could rely on the same things i rely on now which is my breasts mm -hmm. for getting out of a crime you know and just sort of flaunting that and of course one of the best bra thieves in san diego <laughs> Let's not forget that they, out of the bag. <laughs> they wouldn't view you as a person capable of committing exactly. crimes. That's, what, that's just, what I mean. Like, I would really play out get caught red-handed and just go, I'm hysterical. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It's I just did... the lady time of the month. <laughs> I did not know what I was well, thinking. Well, excuse me. I'm getting the vapors. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. My husband was lost and I got confused. Yeah, I would really play that up. Question. And then I would shoot the cop. <laughs> Question number three. In all seriousness, since each microbiome is unique, that includes the microbiomes of our genitals. In a few years, you could swab the genitals of a lover you suspect of infidelity and send it to the lab along with your own swab, and they can tell you if anyone else's genitals have been in contact with your partners. If, no when, this happens, how will a jealous future version of yourself secretly swab your partner's junk? I think for me, as a woman, well... And maybe for Damien. It would work out pretty easily to simply tape the swabs to my fingers mm -hmm. and, and sort of go in for like, ooh, let's get something going. But then how do you then hide your hand for the rest of the encounter? <laughs> I know where to hide my hand. Okay. <laughs> God. It's not a first rodeo. Well, this, this isn't directly answering your question, but here's a w way around it, perhaps. Uh, what if you just had anal sex with whatever partner? You're swabbing for genitals. You're, I mean, they go to test you. Your dick just turns blue. <laughs> Ma'am, the good news is we couldn't find any evidence of another vagina. <laughs> the bad news is Smurf dick. Your husband has not been properly potty trained. <laughs> what? I just had no idea. <laughs> okay, story number two. This is spinal tappingly good news. Scientists have discovered that treating spinal cord injuries in rats with a specific protein, they can actually regrow functioning nerves over long distances. This is amazing news. This may help people who are stuck in wheelchairs. They simulated crushed spines in rats and then treated them with artamin. 
and they got the damaged nerves to grow one and a half inches, and over a month, the new nerves were completely capable of transmitting signals across the entire length of the nerve. Cool. So basically, they grew these nerves, they're completely functional, unbelievable, this is amazing. In fact, this has increased previous nerve regeneration records by a factor of 10, meaning the last most successful nerve regeneration was one-tenth as successful as this. That is really, really impressive. It really is. That's super awesome, but that's not even the coolest part yet. Not only did the nerves grow back, but under the influence of the artemin, which is that protein we were talking about, they also plugged back into their original connections, something that in other studies that showed moderate success in nerve regeneration never had. All the other ones, they just kind of plugged randomly into shit mm -hmm. and went into the wrong places and had the wires crossed. This is the only one in which this actually not only works, it reconnects itself very, very cool. May go a long way to help as a cure for paralysis and a lot of other things. This could be very, very interesting news. A couple of questions for my panelists. Number one, what method do you think they use to simulate crushing a rat's spine? <laughs> I don't want to. I, I actually run this model, so I could tell you how they do it, or we could let Damien have a better answer. All right, Damien? Question Does simulating a crushed spine still result in a crushed spine? Because I don't, if so, I need, I need to have simulation it defined does. to me. <laughs> it does. <laughs> so, like, if I'm a terrified rat thinking, all right, they, listen, they're just going to simulate crushing your First spine. First of all, you're Calm anthropomorphizing. Down. There's no evidence to indicate they're terrified. If I'm Stuart they're Little, they're sedated. <laughs> if I'm Stuart Little and I can communicate, uh -huh. they sound just like Michael J. Fox, who oddly enough would benefit from this study, I think. Okay. Are you a Parkinson, Stuart Little? So we, David, don't, we how, don't need to crush your How nerves. are you going to simulate the crushed rat spine? It's the most realistic and elaborate game of mousetrap. The board game mousetrap. <laughs> like you get to the end and it actually just fucking crushes the spine. <laughs> oh, that's mouse. way more fun than what we actually do, which is tweezers. The answer is tweezers. You use tweezers and you just rip the uh, rat's spine out from No, behind. so you open up the spine, you isolate a very small part of it, and then you pinch it for about 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then that crushes the nerve. And then you let go and then you sew them back up. Uh, I'm sorry, Jackie, that is incorrect. The answer is the angered the Muay Thai champion from the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Kickboxer. No, no. And he then did his finishing move, which is to hit you in the spine while you're on all fours. No, no uh, mine's right. <laughs> uh, sorry. Uh, okay, on to question number two. If we cured paralysis with this technology, would you live your life more dangerously knowing you could always fix a really bad mistake? And what level... Would that type of balls take you to? Wait a minute. I thought we were talking about paralysis, not pregnancies. <laughs> Is that, I just want to be clear on the mistake we're always willing to fix. Well, in a way, isn't an abortion <laughs> just kind of an induced paralysis that's permanent? <laughs> Maybe not. You'll that. never feel it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I don't know if I'm happy like a, with the setup I gave you for that. It's a permanent epidural. <laughs> <laughs> it solves all of your problems. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. You know, would you ride some dirt bikes a little bit I crazier? Would yeah, I would definitely do some crazy shit. I would definitely dance a lot more. Uh -huh. I mean, I have fear for paralysis after some of my dance moves so wait, constantly. Fear of severe traumatic spinal oh, injury. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really what... kick, you know? Like, foot loose. You know what I'm saying? I cannot wait to serve you. I, did you speak <laughs> like in a restaurant? <laughs> This isn't a joke. I know we were just talking about abortion, and, and Jackie was being really callous and gross about it, so oh, I kind of want to bring okay. that up again. But uh -huh. uh, is this like that stripper in Florida, and this was a true news story, who twerked so hard that she had a miscarriage? Exactly, yes. Okay. Ooh, two I birds, was, one stone. You're going to dance so hard, you might break yeah. your spine in that same fashion. Yeah. Fair enough. Damien, what are you going to do differently now that you know that you might be able to cure your paralysis? Work in that restaurant he's been dreaming of. I think that when I become headmaster of a school for gifted and talented people, I think I'm going to have a tough time explaining that I just prefer sitting. Like, I, like I, there's been nothing wrong with my legs. Every year at Christmas, you can walk like it's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> I get extra room on flights. This has so many advantages. It really does. I mean, aside from the not being able to walk, that sounds terrible. Well, that's the thing. I don't have that. <laughs> can walk i'm just lazy question number three in the end if this can completely regrow nerves it may also be able to repair damaged ones especially neurodegenerative disorders in which the myelin sheath is degraded like ms or motor neuron death in diseases like als if we cure als who will keep stephen hawking from conquering the world lazy professor x over there <laughs> damien how is your crippled ass going to stop stephen hawking once he's up and running around have you even thought of this? Yeah, of course. The trick is is to get him early. The man has not used his muscles in years. That's you have right. to hit him like 
So he's while weak. you're, you're is, paralyzed, but he's atrophied, <laughs> and we have the lamest WWE fight in history. <laughs> He's also really old. Like there's a cage and everything. To be fair, it's not so much a cage as it is a six-inch curb around the lip, but it essentially acts as a cage. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, even if there was a ramp on that curb, yeah. I'm still probably not getting up it. <laughs> so it's, it's just resorts to spitting at each other. <laughs> paralyzed Damien versus atrophied Hawking. I would pay to see that oh one, Jackie. God. How about I'm you? I, I would pay more I? than we paid for that Pacquiao Mayweather fight, I'll tell you that. <laughs> How do you think we would keep Stephen Hawking contained? I still believe that his wife would put him in his place. You think she'd regulate? I don't know. I don't think she'd disrupt the empire she's got Was, going on. Wasn't there some rumor a while back that he might have cheated on his wife? Which I always thought yeah. proves that yeah. if, you, if a guy can, he will. <laughs> <laughs> there is so few. Yeah, maybe they don't have a theory of everything after all. What? Could you imagine being Stephen Hawking? You're in the middle of cheating on your wife and you hear her coming up the stairs and it be, essentially becomes like that run over scene in Austin Powers with the steamroller. <laughs> where she, she's a good five and a half minutes out and you're like, no. <laughs> Totally. Secondly, <laughs> let's say she finds out one time. She reads a text message, something like that. It's not like you can just get in the car and leave. <laughs> like, oh, no. That's what I mean. You're I not only she... stuck there, but for the next eight hours, she can lazily dangle a chain around your neck to make it difficult to breathe. <laughs> you got to give him credit because there's no whisper function on that box. If he's that's having true. dirty phone sex, you know, he has to have eyes in the back of his head because that's <laughs> I'm so I... hot. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. About to explore your black hole. <laughs> Let's move right on to Science Fighters. Science Fighters and Science Fighters. Which side are you on? It's a little confusing, I know. It's a double entendre. You know what? Just listen. You'll, you'll like it. All right, guys. Great set of Science Fighters this week. We have a very interesting team up of President Barack Obama and Cuban scientists. Like scientists that belong to Mark Cuban? Yeah. No, they're actually from Cuba. Good question, though. Oh, okay. I think half of America will be really upset and the other half equally upset if we find out which side of the <laughs> Science Fighters fans Obama's on. It's pretty obvious. So <laughs> recently, the United States, uh, under the direction of President Barack Obama, started to lift some of the embargoes that's been imposed on Cuba for quite a few decades now. The first ones to go are going to be the science embargoes that keep research coordination growing on between the two countries. Our RAF technology has <laughs> suffered for years. <laughs> Yeah, that scientific mecca known as fucking Havana. They do have some interesting stuff. One of them is a lung cancer vaccine that's been common in Cuba for a while now. It's very interesting. It's not a vaccine like we think of for... Like the flu or something. Yeah, for like that where you're going to where you can actually keep from getting it. This type of vaccine is a therapeutic agent you give to somebody who already has cancer. That you want to get it. It'd it's more really of a want. weapon of warfare. Therapeutic agent like a James Bond who listens. <laughs> so the vaccine contains a protein called epidermal growth factor or EGF. EGF, which is simulated in the growth of a cell, is found naturally in the body. But cancerous tumors really need a lot of this protein. And so if you can get this vaccine to train your immune so system to essentially attack them and get them out of the way, it keeps the cancer cell from being able to grow as quickly, allows you to slow it down and treat it with other methods. And presumably they can target this just to the cancer cell because EGF is everywhere. Right. I mean, and you need it all the time. Yeah, and you need it at certain levels. I think the mm -hmm. idea is that the immune system keeps it restrained to the levels that are required by your body without allowing the cancer to take up the kind that it would mm -hmm. usually take. Okay. This can also be used for many different types of cancer as well because it's a frequent way in which cancer metastasizes. It'll be nice to see the flood of scientific collaboration that goes back and forth. I'm sure the it'll be an equal is... share by both sides. <laughs> the flood is generous. And new ideas <laughs> tested out. It is really interesting. It'll be interesting to see this go through FDA trials. It'll be interesting to see the validity oh, yeah of this and if we can adapt the technology to use for other things as well, other kinds of cancer. So are the Cuban scientists and the president on the same side of the yes. science fighting fence? They are both fighting are both for science. Science Hence fighters. Their science fighting fighters. for science. Yes. Okay. The, all right. There we go. That was a lot. That was much more clear than the introduction fucking ever was. No, David, it's pretty clear that we all benefit when Cuban doctors and politicians decide to act like real science fighters. All right, let's move right on to I Call BS. I call. I call. I call. I call. I call. Ring, ring. I call BS. 
All right, this is I Call BS, the game in which I give my panelists four scientific articles, and they tell me which ones are true, or BS, standing for bad science. We have a very special episode today, guys. Mm. Today is the Battle of the Sexes, or otherwise known as the BS. Oh, look at you. <laughs> Wow. Each one of these four articles involves some kind of differential gender specific thing that has been discovered or has it by <gasps> science recently. Are you guys ready to play? I'm ready and I would like to propose to Damien, my worthy opponent, that if you win today, I'll take back what I said earlier about having a Damien for a year. Okay, so so basically And I'll talk to Bobby about how I asked him to fire you. You won't quit. Okay, all right, I won't be fired. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Oh no, I'm not quitting. Well, I can't wait to do this, because as they say, men are from Mars, and Jackie's a cunt. (laughs) (laughs) They do say that. Let's get right on. (laughs) Article number one, a recent study shows that sex education and health classes have more effect on young girls than on young boys. What do you mean effect? As frequent follow-up tests later on show as to their education and knowledge of sexual issues. Okay. Not like freaking them the fuck out with warts. Nope. Okay. Article number two, lemur species in which females dominate males show an increase of male hormones in individually dominant females. Article number three, new MRI research looking at the brains of autistic children show that young autistic males are more different from their non-autistic peers than young females are to their non-autistic peers. Article number four. New research suggests that when the shaming and potential for violence is controlled for, women want to have sex approximately 70% as much as men. All right, guys, let's see how this battle of the sexes turns out in our very own Madhouse Comedy Club studio. Article number one, a recent study shows that sex education and health classes have more of an effect on young girls than on young boys. Damien, is this science or bad science? I got to say this is bad science. You cannot stop a boy from learning about sex at this age. It's like the one (laughs) subject he'll go home and study for. So you're saying he doesn't need the sex education. Okay. Interesting. Jackie, how about you? Um, Okay. I'm going to say this is science and for two reasons. The first reason is, as you might recall in our elementary school, the first two years of sex ed that we had, which was fifth and sixth grade, the boys were allowed to go to recess while the girls had to stay behind and learn about sex ed. Well, to be fair, you should be punished for that horrible thing that comes out of your vagina. That's what it was all about. Yeah. (laughs) Secondly, I think at this age, while men are more interested in sex, I think women are, um, or girls are more adept to actually learning about reproduction, etc. I mean, if I choose to bleed out of my penis, I guess I would give up my rights to recess, too. Yeah, well, I guess you would. I guess you fucking would. There are drawings of boobs. This is the first class with drawings of boobs. Are you telling me that a 13-year-old Damien would not be the best student in the class at looking <laughs> so at I'm those ju- boobs? Well, f- I'm just saying, you were there. You weren't even allowed in. Besides... <laughs> It's like you said, it's mostly period stuff. Yeah, Damien, God, think of all the lesbo stuff that happened in that all-girls class. (laughs) It's pretty sweet. (laughs) So many pillows. Super hot and heavy in there. All right, on to article number two. Lemur species in which females dominate males show an increase of male hormones in individual dominant females. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is science. You can always tell those lemurs because they all look like China from the WWE. Yeah, they might have had some artificial hormones in them, too. Lemur alone. Yeah. They sleep with male lemurs who aren't ready to admit they're gay yet. (laughs) Maybe they're just like a husky woman. I mean, muscular. (laughs) Chiseled. There's nothing wrong with a six-inch clit. All right, Jackie, go ahead. Um, I'm going to say this is bad science. I think it could be that they have more female hormones, and that's what makes them so bitchy. (laughs) Ah! Article number three, new MRI research looking at the brains of autistic children showed that young autistic males are more different from their non-autistic peers than young females are to their non-autistic peers. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. Because, yeah, autistic boys are far behind their peers in terms of Rathhausen and being a boy. But, I mean, autistic girls are ten times that in terms of being passive-aggressive and bitchy. (laughs) They can really get away from that social construct, huh? Hey, I get to the say, girls. I get to say women are bitchy. You can't use that yeah. word. That is our word. <laughs> that is our word. I didn't call you a cunt at the start yeah, of this. Like, you didn't, that I didn't get a H- talking to. H-B-I-C. <laughs> Jackie's really trying to take cunt back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, I heard about those pillow fighting classrooms. I know. <laughs> I also think this is bad science. I think while there are more boys, I think we've 
talked about on the show, there are more boys who are on the autistic spectrum than girls. But I think girls manifest uh, more severely than boys. And so I would imagine they're quite different from their counterparts. All right. And article number four, new research suggests that when shaming and the potential for violence is controlled for, women want to have sex approximately 70% as much as men. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science because women don't rape 70% as much as men. (laughs) (laughs) My question is why? First of all, you don't know what happened in those classrooms. (laughs) (laughs) My question is, why would you want to take the shaming and the violence out of sex? I mean, what's the point? <laughs> Those are the best parts. How else are women going to know to be ashamed? Jackie grew up Catholic. That's essential to love. Yeah. Goddamn right. <laughs> Hell, I'll say it's science. I think 70% is maybe a good estimate. I think it could be actually less, but I'll, I'll say it's science. Perfect. All right, guys. Hope you followed along at home. Let's see who won this battle of the genders. I have very interesting news to reveal to you guys. One of you got a perfect score. Ooh. Damn. Damn. Question number one. A recent study shows that sex education and health classes have more of an effect on young girls than on young boys. Damien thought this one was false. Jackie thought this one was true. And this one is bad science. Oh, no. Perfect score. It's Damien. I'm going to go take a dump. You can go ahead and be shamed for a bit. <laughs> Damien was kind of right. Uh, I it go was, down. It was, it was the opposite. So there was a, an effect at six months tested that was present in a lot of the young boys in which they had a better understanding of sex, risk, abstinence, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. The effect did kind of fizzle and go away after about a year, but there was no effect whatsoever on the young girls that had it at that six-month trial. So uh, What about after the year? Yeah, same, that, same thing. Really? Yeah. No shit. Just one study. This doesn't mean anything for all sexual education. Obviously, different sex ed ed will do different things for different people. This was a single one-time use program. It's a one-off type study. so A one-night stand of studies. Don't extrapolate. Number two, lemur species in which female dominate males show an increase of male hormones in individual dominant females. Damien thought this was true. Uh, Jackie thought this was false. Of course, if we discuss, this is science. They studied six lemur species, four of which, four of these <laughs> species. So many obscene gestures right now coming from Jamie. And- I'm sorry. You've been, you've been dancing on my groin for the last couple of weeks about this game. I'm just going to be doing just, I'm not going to interrupt Bobby. I'm just going to be doing a dance in your direction this whole time. It'll be smug. It's a bit sexy. I, I don't hope know they I, can hear the smugness I coming through. I can handle it. They studied six different lemur species. Four of these lemur species are female dominant, meaning they kind of buck the trend of mammals, especially primates, in which the females are actually the physically more mm-hmm. dominant one, even though they're about the same size as the males. There's okay. not a sexual dimorphism. Two of the species, uh, essentially, the roles are equal. In the ones where the females are dominant, they do show higher levels of male hormones in those dominant females. So mm. maybe it's some of that testosterone that makes us ball so hard. <laughs> of course, the ball so hard argument. <laughs> where has that been in the past 20 minutes? <laughs> On to article number three. New MRI research looking at the brains of autistic children shows that young autistic males are more different from their non-autistic peers than young females are to their non-autistic peers. You both thought this was false. You both were right. It is the opposite. Females actually have higher levels of differences, like Jackie said, both in action and in the physical parts of their brain. The research at this point was looking at the corpus callosum connections to the frontal part of the brain and found more severe limitations in females relative to their non-autistic counterparts than they did in males, there might be a biological difference in that amount. And we know that the sex ratio is way off. Four males have autism for every one female. Might have different causes, different effects, different symptoms, different everything when it comes to this. We need more studies into uh, female autism. This was actually one of the largest studies that included female autism. I think they had 27 uh, young girls in it. Oh, my God. So... Something to think about. Article number four. New research suggests that when shaming and the potential for violence is controlled for, women want to have sex approximately 70% as much as men. Damien thought this was false. Jackie thought this was true. This was obviously bad science. The answer is 100%. When you control for societal shaming and the potential for violence, and they did this in a lab setting where somebody was essentially going through Tinder. It was a (laughs) Tinder-like thing. And they told them to pick who they liked to date or have sex with. They would present them with these options depending on if they were in, what group they were in. And um, they were told these people wanted to date you or have sex with you. Do, would you also like to date them or have sex with them? 
and the first 30 minutes of your date will be monitored by video camera, which will essentially negate the danger part of it. You know, you'll have something there to, to watch over you when you meet this person. Would you? While do you have sex? I don't. <laughs> well, no. Up until so you yeah, you can go have meet... the control for angles. I mean, like how, they, how do we know that the angle they have is going right. to be the hottest angle? That's bullshit. That's total it's, bullshit. It's so you can go meet the person, and and if you don't like them, you can leave, and you're it's all videotaped, and you you know you're you're probably going to be fine as opposed mm. to just meeting in a, ra- a random person in a random place. Unless you try to leave after the 30 minutes. In which case, you're locked in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're fucked. So basically, when you do that, it balances out, and women want to bone just as much as dudes. Damien is indicating to me that he also thinks that's bullshit. <laughs> Listen, I agree. As, as, as the best scientist here with my perfect score. Mm, yes, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I get to stay on the show, too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think we agree. So You'd be did fired. I do that for you? <sighs> You purposely gave me a perfect score. You pur- you purposely gave me the answer. Oh my answers god, good job, Jackie. No, she didn't do anything like Thank that. You. Jesus, I how did. selfless of you. Fuck all of you. And wow, you did such a great job. You got him a per you didn't even just make him win. You got him a perfect score. It's I've been learning how to like read facial expressions and This is fantastic. And- She's cheating. <laughs> or endorsing cheating. <laughs> So basically, when you control for that and throw a video camera in the room for 30 minutes to ensure safety, chicks are totally down to bone. So I guess what I'm saying is, Jackie, there's a video camera in the corner of this room that's been recording us for at least 30 minutes. What are you waiting for? I told you, I like the shaming and the violence. (laughs) Keep it interesting. You are a model for young women everywhere. (laughs) Speaking of which, let's move right on to finish my story. Finish my story, where one of us has to complete the other's balls. All right, guys, finish my story is where our research scientist Jackie presents us with the beginning of a recent science article and myself and Damien compete to try and finish that article. Damien, are you ready to play? Yeah, I'm perfect. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah, he's coming off that eye. That he is indeed. All right, Jackie, what is it? Well, you can imagine my heartbreak over my loss. Although unlike Damien, I find myself to be a good loser. And so I'm not going to rub it or be sour about it forever since, I mean, I won for so long. It's kind of hard to remember how long it was. But anyway. (laughs) Damien, now here's a question. Do you personally, Damien, do you make a distinction between a quote unquote good loser and what we usually, you would call yourself like a huge loser? Like, do you, (laughs) do you distinguish between those two? Yeah, I'm a good loser because I, I do it with style. Okay. I do it with oh, okay. grace. I make it look purposeful. <laughs> and then afterwards, you uh, high five the dude in the line and, and yell, "Good game!" Yeah. <laughs> Listen, when we when her and I were playing before, she was like the Harlem Globetrotters. I was the Washington Generals. I was supposed to lose. People gotcha. come out to see her. Yeah. Oh, right? don't take down this fourth wall, baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, people are listening. <laughs> okay, guys, I want to I want to get down to the soul now. Down to like real deep down. Let's let's do some talking. How can you mend a broken heart? Well, I mean, first, it has to be removed from the body cavity via bare hand mm. from the Indiana Jones documentary I mm. saw. Mm-hmm. Or sure. Kano. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yep, I did see that documentary. Once you pull Excellent. it out, then easy to fix. It's like, it's like a transmission. It's a bitch to get at when it's in the car. You drop it out, 20 minutes, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, if only they'd use that technique in the later documentary, The Crystal Skull. I mean, I think that would have really brought Go on, Move on to Damien. You've angered me. <laughs> Damien, what do you think? How how can you mend a broken heart? With the support of some of your best girlfriends. Here, here, chicas. Dare to tell you that he was just a scrub, and you don't want no scrub. Isn't a isn't a scrub one of those guys who can't go no love from me? Yes, yeah. I mean, well, he's like hanging out the passenger side of his best friend's ride, like trying to holler at me. Do you and I have the same female friends? Because I feel like we do. Yeah, you've received this advice before. Yeah. By the way. You guys kind of hang out with some materialist cunts. <laughs> I know Jackie's trying to take that word back. <laughs> yeah, thank you for embracing it with me. So um, you meant that in a positive, not a pejorative. I mean, what if that guy's got like a great sense of humor and he's really loving and stuff? Just the fact that he doesn't have his own car? You're kind of being a bitch about this. Yeah, but he's hollering at me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, st- keep it in. Like, wait till you get to the club and buy me a drink. Don't be hollering at me at your you best can, friend's ride. You can cross the street and approach me like a human being. You yeah. don't need to holler at me. Yeah, come on. Uh, you clearly don't understand my culture. All right, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're both wrong because the answer is obviously stem cells, you idiots. So this is a study uh, that was published a little while ago um, in the journal Cell Stem Cell. 
Um, and it's actually some research that was done here in San Diego at the Sanford Burnham Medical Research Institute, the Human Biomolecular Research Institute, and Kim Regan. Basically, what happened is they did a screen looking for modulators of cardiomyocyte regeneration. Um, heart disease is the leading cause of death in this country, and because we can't replace lost cardiac muscle, the condition irreversibly leads to a decline in heart function, and this ultimately leads to death. The only way to effectively replace lost heart muscle cells is to transplant the entire heart. So the idea that you could have a drug that you could just give to somebody to re-stimulate this cardiomyocyte growth would be revolutionary. So basically, you're spackling over the crack in the drywall as opposed to ripping it out and laying new sheetrock. Pretty much, okay. yes. Pretty Fair much. Enough. So the way that they're hoping to do this is with stem cells. Stem cells are important because they can do two unique things. They self renew, producing more stem cells, and they differentiate becoming into specialized cell types, which is really what people are most interested in in general. To obtain a large number of a certain cell type, like cardiomyocytes, the hard part is figuring out the signals that direct them to become the desired cell type. The scientists at the multiple institutes use sophisticated robots robotic technology to methodically test a large collection of drug-like chemicals looking for a needle in a haystack that when added to stem cells results in cardiomyocytes and the winning compound is called ITD1. And what I really like about this article is this is demonstrating what the current and sort of new frontier in finding drugs is, which is screening millions of drugs in cell-based assays that can do something rather than trying to target a disease and going down a pathway that you know. This is just a black box of testing everything you've got and seeing what works. And if it does work, then pursuing that. And so it gives you a lot from the beginning to work with, and then you can go down all kinds of different pathways. It bothers me that scientists still play these jokes on one another. I mean... I don't know if you guys could tell, but the way it works, you know, when you're naming something, the guy who, who creates the thing or creates the new strain, he gets to name it, right? Yeah. So the bully scientist will sometimes sneak in, like, joke names. And in this case, it was I Touch Dick 1. And that was <laughs> – once they found out the test was successful, they're huh. like, let's sneak this in there. Then he'll have to call it that for the rest of the time. He, he at least abbreviated it to – what was yeah, that again? ITD1. That's you know, right. I, I, didn't, I didn't see that in the abbreviations page, but I will I looked up the corresponding literature. Some of us do our homework, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, uh, the researchers discovered that ITD1 blocks a cellular process known as TGF beta signaling. TGF beta is short for transforming growth factor beta. It's a protein produced by one cell type to influence another's behavior, such as proliferation, scarring, and even differentiation. I never recommend blocking somebody trying to touch a dick. That could only end badly. <laughs> it's like get between a mother bear and her cub. It's yeah, it's how you get bit. <laughs> So ITD1 basically triggers degradation of TGF-beta receptor, inhibiting the whole process. So with TGF-beta signaling turned off, stem cells are set on a course toward cardiogenesis. ITD1 is the first selective inhibitor of TGF-beta, meaning that it might also have applications in many other controlled processes. Who knew touch and dick could cure your heart? <laughs> I'm going to live forever. <laughs> My mom has that sewn on a pillow at home, so I know that. Thank you so much, Jackie. Before we go, let's move right on to our voicemail of the week. Normally, we look at the group of people who have the biggest explosion in current listeners. We mm -hmm. get those reports every Thursday morning before we uh, tape this show. Since yeah, we, we had a little scheduling conflict, we had to tape early this week. We weren't able to do that. We promise we'll get back to you, whoever's been subscribing the most in the last week. We'll get back to you next week. Don't worry about it. We'll get you. But until then, uh, this particular outgoing voicemail message will be for one specific fan who's headed out to start our local fan club in a new location. We'd like to dedicate the episode and voicemail to you, buddy. Here is this week's outgoing voicemail message for our number one fan in Okinawa. Hi, I'm comedian and Pixar creation, Damien Mercado, and you've reached the voicemail of an Okinawan. Okinawa is unique because it has elements of Chinese culture in it. For example, due to their bizarre sense of humor, you should never leave your coke unattended around an Okinawan. The Okinawan diet is one of the most healthy in the world. The diet consists mostly of fish, rice, and shame. Okinawa is one-third the size of Rhode Island, both in land mass and penis size. Okinawa, home to some of history's finest swordsmen. Seriously, they were hot. Please leave a message after the beat. Come on out to Okinawa, a place where young Marines from the Midwest can explore their Asian fetish. All right. Thanks so much, Damien. Please go ahead and check out the website at thesciencefaction.com. Also, make sure to come back and tune in to episode 72, where undoubtedly Damien will continue talking about comedy contests he has not won. Oh, I thought we were going to get through an episode this time. I thought so, too. Thank you so much. Maybe episode 72. We'll see you later. You've been listening to Science Fiction. 
Wait, that's not right.